Hi everyone, how are you? My name is Eugene Hernandez from the New York Film Festival, Film at Lincoln Center. I'm also um, one of the advisors or advisory board for South by Southwest, so it's just really great to be back in person and to be able to sit in a moment in conversation with some really terrific folks. So thanks for being here and thanks for being a part of South by and to those who are watching or who will be watching at home, thanks for joining us virtually. So, uh, so let's get to it. Uh, what a special show this is. It's really special for us to have, or for special for me to have the opportunity to talk with uh, folks behind this, what's become my, my new favorite show. I've just been binging it, uh, and I got to watch uh, the second season, or much of the second season recently, so really excited to talk about Undone with many folks you will recognize, or names you will know. Please join me in first welcoming Rosa Salazar. You're sitting right next to me. Angelique Cabral. Come on down. Constance Marie. Welcome, welcome. Come on down. Co-creator and showrunner, Kate Purdy. Come on down. And director and executive producer, Hisko Hulsing. Come on down. Yeah, all the way down. All right, who's actually seen all of season one already? Okay, good, okay, good, okay, good. Um, I think I'm one of the few people that's seen a good chunk of season two. Yeah, you've seen more than we have. We haven't seen. <laughs> so jealous. I haven't seen anything. The trailer, so. It's so beautiful, and you're gonna get a taste of season two in a moment, because we're gonna show some clips. Yes. Um, that'll be fun. I know, I'm so excited. I know. <laughs> you're gonna get to see some clips. I'm a fan, too. <laughs> and you're gonna get to see some clips, too. Um, so, I'm gonna start with Kate. Uh, we saw a little bit at the end of that t trailer, or the, t the, the look back that we just saw, we saw a, a release date. That's right, April 29th. Yeah. Official. Hello. Folks have been waiting. A little I'm, while. I'm sure you've been waiting to <laughs> unveil it. I, I can only imagine that uh, in light of things that have been happening in the world, it might have been delayed a little bit. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. It takes us about a year and a half to produce it, but with COVID and the pandemic, it took an extra year. Yeah, I think it was two and a half years yeah. Yeah, since the release of first season. Like I had an entire other child. <laughs> right. right, yes. <laughs> Since we, we started season two. Well, I have questions for all of you. I'm gonna start with Kate. Um, I mean, I'm sure uh, folks who have seen season one and the fact knowing now that the season two is right around the corner, um, there's a terrific cliffhanger at the end of season one. Um, and for those who've already seen it, I would be. I would love to hear more about your decision to end the first season with fans left wondering whether Alma was having a mental break or did she acquire the ability to manipulate time. Maybe talk a little bit about how you got to that, to that crescendo, that that cliffhanger at the end of season one. Absolutely. So my co-creator Raphael Bob Waxberg, who isn't here today, his son is turning one years old, but he's here with us in spirit. Um, he and I were talking about philosophy and life experiences, and that became the, the seed for Undone. And we realized that we had different perspectives of reality, different perspectives of how we were experiencing life, and we wanted to create that central tension in the show. Yeah. So actually, every scene has to work to represent multiple realities at once so that you can see the show and decide for yourself what's happening. Yeah. We wanted that to be an active conversation with the audience. So ending the series, uh, the, f the first season with that central tension um, was how we wanted to end it for, for that kind of conversation with our audience. And so that people could walk away feeling like they had an understanding and then realize someone else could have a different understanding. And hopefully that creates a little empathy, that creates a little, oh my gosh, we're <laughs> seeing the same thing but having a different experience, yeah. and maybe we can open our mindset a little bit to take in other people's realities or, or sense of what reality is. You know, I think to, I was gonna ask you this a little later in the conversation, but I'm gonna throw it in now because I think it builds on what you were just talking about, Kate, and that is, do you mind just sharing with us uh, like a little snapshot of kind of the origin story? You touched on it a second ago, the origin story for this series and how it sort of grew for you. Certainly. So 
uh, a few years ago, I had a kind of a mental break and was experiencing some pretty heavy depression, anxiety, trying to work through it, and uh, found meditation, found alternative healing, found some like ancient texts that helped me as well as some healers and amazing people with large hearts who just loved me through that time. And uh, it opened up my sense of reality immensely in terms of thinking what is sort of beyond what we see and experience, what is sort of unseen and unknown that's out there, could that be coming from our ancestry, is time linear or does it sort of work like a circle, <laughs> like some you know philosophies or sciences believe. Um, and so talking with Raphael about all of those different matters, we started thinking about, well, how can we build this into a show? How can we build relatable, lovable, wonderful characters who are all experiencing reality from different perspectives mm -hmm. and weave that together into a series? It looks at um, some very specific, you know, heavy, sometimes serious uh, issues of mental health, but maybe you want to elaborate also on how you also thought about weaving that into the narrative of a family, what kind of inspirations you were drawing, um, and how you might, how you hope that conversation will evolve for folks as they start to, start to connect with season two soon. Absolutely, so my grandmother had schizophrenia as well as a few of my great uncles, two of her brothers, and it was, kind of, it was a family secret, we didn't talk about it, mm -hmm. and so, um, and when I would bring it with my dad, I would just get little pieces, you know, like he, he would say, one time she, shoved a broom handle through the television set. And that becomes part of our series. Like that's one scene that we kind of keep returning to because that stuck with me. It was like one piece of information I could get. And so in the second season, it's, it really becomes these sisters on a journey to explore their ancestry. Like to go deeper and figure out what are all these things that have come before them that are the family secrets that have unconsciously shaped who they are because they're on a journey to understand themselves better. So with that in mind, I want to give our audience and I want to give our cast on stage a, a chance to look at a clip from the second season. So look, we're going to see three clips. Let's look at the very first one. It's called uh, I Wanted to Ask You. Um, so let's roll that clip. I wanted to ask you, is there something going on with mom? Yeah, no, I know. Something is definitely going on with her. I just tried to talk to her about it and she won't talk to me. Well, what do you think it is? Well, I did see something. Early in the morning after the wedding, I stopped by to drop some stuff off before taking our flight. Mom was in the car outside the house. Becca, what are you doing here? Oh my God. Wait, it was you. You're the one who saw this. What? What's that? Ah, it's nothing. An old friend. What? Who? So you were thinking about this during dinner? What I saw, I saw through you. You saw that? But no one's ever been able to see that before. Before? This has happened before? You can visit past memories? You can move through time like that? No, I'm not like time traveling or anything. It's not weird like that. Becca, you are time traveling. You are a time traveler. And so am I. I mean, I can't right now, but we can do this together. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so similar to our actual relationship. Yeah, literally. That sums us up, actually. <laughs> I would make you time travel. And you would. I love that eyebrow raise, and I love the line, I wrote it down again for myself, we can do this together. Mm. Because I think that that just like sets the stage for what we're about to encounter yeah. in season two, right? Kate? Definitely, and what I love about that dynamic too is that Rose's character Alma needs Becca, and Becca needs Alma to help her through this to understand it. 
and Alma doesn't always have the patience to explain everything, <laughs> and really, really wants to get to what, to what she wants to get to, right. <laughs> and so it becomes kind of a, a tense and, and comedic relationship and right. dynamic between these two as they're trying to delve deep within themselves. I think it's super cool that I sort of step into the Bob role, yeah. the dad role of like, like teaching, and just, just come with that. me through right. this fog, right. and, and she's like, <laughs> wait like, a wait, second. Wait, what? No. Um, <laughs> so you step into more of an Alma role, yeah. and I'm like uh, trying to get you to embrace. Right. Much, I'm, I'm not willing no. either. You have to like really coerce. No, them I to mean do it. Alma in the first season is really into the right. idea, um, <laughs> and you're like, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like good I, here. I, yeah. I don't need to time travel. I'm fine. <laughs> I mean, Rosa, there's a lot to dig into, so I'm going to start with you. Okay. Looking at Alma, I mean, she's. She's struggling with these powers, these perceived powers, as we start season two. Um, how do you see that evolving with her journey into season two or, or enriching sort of the way we think about this character now? How did you think about that? Well, um, at the end of season one, you've got a really healthy cliffhanger. And the, all of season one, you're, you're, the question is, are, is she crazy or does she have abilities? Is she schizophrenic or is she a shaman? And um, I, I think we all have our answer. Like you were saying earlier, we can all experience the show in different ways. Um, but I think going into season two, I, it's, uh, for me, it was a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, and then we expand on that and to see the heritage and what she's inherited in terms of her abilities and her neuroses, um, her, you know, mental illness, her, her, her mental illness and her um, powers. And so it just, you just go further into that well. And I think that Becca is just starting on that journey. Yeah. And like we just said, Alma becomes a teacher, even though she's still learning the limits of her own yeah. capabilities. Well, let me follow up on that, because you were talking about kind of these different ways that folks can, can view this character in particular. You have um, the unique opportunity to explore this character from those different perspectives. As you were getting to, starting to mine this character and how you would explore it, were you weighing one direction or the other, or were you, were you doing that kind of column A, column B? How were you sort of weaving all that into your own approach to depicting her? Well, I don't think it's, I think it cat's out of the bag. I love to play a dynamic woman. Yeah. I, and um, I always look at my characters like a 12-sided die right. of um, qualities, uh, it, not even can qualify it good or bad. It's just a 12-sided die of qualities. Dimensions. And yeah. Dimensions, yeah. yeah. And um, Alma is no exception. Um, but yeah, for, for me, I think that one services the other and yeah. then that services back. It's, it's the yin and the yang. It isn't just um, chicken and egg. It's, yeah. it's chicken, egg, stars, dust, <laughs> cosmos. It's like, it's everything. So yeah. I think that her mental illness or her personality defects <laughs> um, feed her abilities. They come from her abilities. They yeah. feed her abilities and her abilities um, do the same thing. Yeah. They inform her. Or they start to change her and inform her who she is and who she's becoming and what she's capable of becoming. I like that the two of you landed on this word abilities yeah. and Angelique, I want to dig into this with you. Um, so Becca seems sort of less excited about or she's less embracing of these of these powers than maybe the character of Alma, but why do you think she's so, what do you see as the character's resistance to kind of using these new abilities, to use your word, and how she will ultimately kind of make her own peace with this? I think that Becca, her resistance comes from kind of seeing Alma's kind of struggle and journey from season one, knowing kind of what she's gone through and where she's ended up and witnessing firsthand her kind of trauma. And I think that she doesn't want to go through that. And, you know, Becca's kind of buttoned up and everything is perfect. And she has this life that she's trying to achieve for herself and her family. And I think that this kind of derails that. <laughs> and I think that that's not where she wants to go, but inevitably, She's also extremely 
empathetic and um, involved with her family. And I think she sees the generational trauma there. And I think she wants to, she's a fixer. So I think she uses this as a tool to fix. Mm. And Alma seems, knows that. So right. She manipulates. Them. She knows that. And she's, <laughs> the hell out of her. And I'm wanting to fix her. I'm wanting to fix her. I'm wanting to fix me. I think there's a part of Becca that really wants to go deep into the, the, the generational trauma there and fix. So yeah. I think that's where her kind of interest comes from Yeah. In, in these abilities. Yeah. Kate, how does this track for you so far? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, and I, I like what you're both saying too in terms of knowing each other and knowing how to sort of play each other and get what you want from each other and then how to try to right. build boundaries and those boundaries to get I tested. I mean, we really push each other's buttons, don't we? Right, Like the yeah. entire season. We're just like, con it's like. Wow, okay. <laughs> in like real life and also. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I'm like, shh. No, it's cool. It's fine. <laughs> um, but the, the way that, well, I thought what was so beautiful about season one is that it depicted a, a, a tragedy yeah. in a family and you see two people who have been raised in the same environment, eating the same food, breathing the same air, raised by the same people who choose completely different yeah. paths um, and how to deal with it. You know, you, you have a rebel and you have someone who adapts. Mm -hmm. I'll let you pick who's who. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that Alma is definitely the kind of person who is, who is searching who is constantly searching, you know, regardless of that is someone who is, but well, what does that I mean? I think that, that comes out a little bit in yeah. Becca. Yeah. I think she's like also got that in her. And I think that that's also what's so beautiful, right? The, the pulling out of that searching and that longing. Yeah. Um, Cause I think even in season one, you see that she wants more than Reed, you know, and she knows that. And I think that that's, what's kind of ballsy and baller about her is she's like kind of fuck it. Let's do this at the end. And you help me with that. Yeah. Alma helps me. Oh, me. I yeah. thought you were talking to Eugene. <laughs> first, like, <laughs> Eugene helped me a lot. Way to go, so. Eugene. <laughs> too. He really we're help in the moment here. Um, You're going to love Eugene in episode seven. <laughs> <laughs> he really shines. Is that why you got be, to see it before we did? Not one yet. Cool, I'm up for it. Um, Constance, uh, it seems like Camilla has a secret that she might want to share, but um, I don't want to put you on the spot. So. Mm -mm. Why don't Kate we, is right there. I know, I she's right next to you. you. Why don't we do this? Why don't we take a look at another clip and then we'll talk about that a little oh, bit. Oh, yay. So okay, I'm ready. Another clip from Undone. What is it? We are here to find out exactly what your secret is. So we can help you. Girls, it's very late and I can smell the wine on your breath. Who is Alejandro? You told Alma? I don't like keeping secrets from people. Well, I told you, it's nothing. We also saw this painting by Alejandro. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and we know about the money you sent. <laughs> and we know about the long distance calls you've made. I don't know what you're accusing me of, but I don't like it. Did you have an affair? Excuse me? <laughs> I know you think that you're protecting us by keeping it in, but whatever you're doing, it's just making it worse. Yeah, mom, we're adults. We can handle it. Say you banged some guy behind dad's back. <laughs> we're cool. Please leave my house. No, mom, if you care about us at all, you have to tell us the truth because not telling us is just hurting the whole family. I have given my life to this family. You have no idea what I have given up for you. You girls are so ungrateful. Damn. Yeah, it makes me like cry. I right? know. Up, yeah. Oh my god. I mean, we haven't seen any of this. It's so, so rich. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It's what can let you tell it us ride. About, <laughs> what can you <laughs> tease <laughs> us with or tantalize us with about sort of where this journey is gonna gonna take us? Kate. In the next few weeks. No. <laughs> um, well, it's it's just watching the dynamic on how we all as humans, which is what I love about the show, is it's so universal as humans and as a mother myself, yeah. I am constantly trying to let go of what no longer served me from my raising, you know, my, my um, upbringing and improve for my daughter. And I see Camilla's coping mechanisms have actually really affected Becca greatly and our denial and we're just going to be that little rubber duck that no matter what happens, we're gonna pop up and we're not gonna deal with what was pulling us under. Adaptive. And yeah, and um, it's very interesting to see 
just that struggle for your own version of consciousness, for your own version of who you choose to be. Mm. And um, I, that's, I want to, I want to weep when I no, see you that. See it's like yeah. falling apart. Because she has her version and she has yeah. her version and I've, you know, shaped them. And sh uh, Becca is in the image of my coping mechanisms and it's stopping her and she knows the truth and I still cannot admit it. And I fight it. And there's so many parents who are like, I know I messed up, but I'm gonna be in complete denial of this and it's not gonna help your children at all. <laughs> And so it's just, just even in one little scene, it's so unbelievably rich. Um, and so I can say that um, Camilla's journey is so multi-layered and frag fragile and fragmented and tortured. Yeah. But you, it's so funny, you know, emotional thinking about it. Oh, We're like so tragic. emotional. Yeah, it's, it's, very it's, tragic. it's just, she's just made so many wrong decisions. And it's had the effect on her children and on her relationship. And, um... It's also, I think that, not to jump in there, but I think that we're all feeling this emotion because we shot this. I don't feel yeah. it. During, <laughs> except, except Rosa. <laughs> during a time where we really were like only had each other because right. like the world was shut down two years ago and right. we're just seeing this for the first time. And when we shoot this, we don't see any of this beautiful, rich it's art. ugly. Right. <laughs> it's, very ugly. Fantastic it's very ugly. Art. It's very raw. So like yeah. we are blown away also and so right. bringing up all these emotions again of shooting during a pandemic when you're like, what are we doing? And they weren't with us. Like they were on Zoom. Mm -hmm. We never, we, there was eight people on these stages and we were just like alone kind of, we had each other as lifelines. We cried, we cried a lot. All the time. You and like, me. It was a very heavy. I time. mean, it's, it's gorgeous, but we just had tape <laughs> and, yeah, and, we had and nothing. pretend we had white cardboard with black tape on it for part of it, and then we went into a big stage, and then it had green tape. And you're I acting mean, to like dummy heads, and they're just like, trust us. You're like, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> like the love between Bob Odenkirk's character and myself, he wasn't even there, right? I did it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> like all women do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and also just the story of like the three women, like it's mm. such a strong, these three Latinas that you don't yep. see right. really on television. And, and not stereotypical so at all, no. reinvented. It could be any story. We don't even wear a hoop. There's no hoops. No. <laughs> and we didn't have a burrito, not even once. Not even once. <laughs> what I love about the second season is that um, it, we we go into our ancestry from both sides. Mm -hmm. right. You know, mm -hmm. we get to see the Jewish ancestry and you know there's some trauma there. And we get to see our Mexicana ancestry and you In know the there's some mm -hmm. trauma there. Right. And it, yeah. it, you know, it, it all is stored in our bodies, yeah. you know, and here, and here we are, the amalgamation of all of those decisions, all of those generations. And you're bringing all those relationships from outside of the show, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Whether being a mom or whether being relationships with family, complications, Absolutely. secrets, siblings, past. Yeah. Absolutely. Siblings, yeah. But the best part is watching how each of them handles the <laughs> trauma. Yeah. And the fact that Alma's character makes it funny all the time. And she's tortured. She's tortured. Oh, yeah. I'm the and saddest person on the And she's planet. hilarious. <laughs> And then Becca feels everything so deeply and guards everything so much to protect the reality that she wants. Right, she's trying to keep it of, together. Yeah, it's just, LOL. it's magical. Bravo, by the way. And then she Bravo. like breaks, you know, of course. But because I'm breaking all the right. time. Mm. And, and I think there, that's, it can be even more heartbreaking than someone trying to keep it together. It's just like, I'm falling apart. Right. Um, I'm not well. Uh, no, but I think that's how, you know, and I am definitely more of a, a daddy's girl on this show. We definitely, mm -hmm. our personalities uh, click, but he is more of a scientist about things. He's more of a questioner about things. He's more of an investigator. And I think that um, this side of the family is more like, just let sleeping dogs lie. Yeah, Why ask just questions? Leave it, just leave it. Just step just over the dogs laying all yeah. over the floor. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'm like, you know, doing yeah. biopsies on the dogs. <laughs> Undone. Well put. Well, Undone. Well Check put. it out. So, Hisco, hello. 
Hello. Welcome from Amsterdam. <laughs> Can't get Here a word go. in edgewise. <laughs> I was very silent, but uh, yeah. That's going to change now. That's going to change now. So, so there's so much we can talk. We've talked about the characters, developing them. We've talked about the journeys they're on for the first, you know, half hour or so. Um, and now I want to switch gears and talk about, I mean, this show is just stunning to watch. It's beautiful to look at. There's so many layers, not only the emotional layers and the story uh, layers and components that we're talking about, but the, the imagery. Um, help us, for, for folks who may not understand or know the process of, it's called rotoscoping, right? So maybe kind of walk us through how, how an episode gets built from the, from the like, you from know. From scratch, yeah. From, you know, the, yeah. everybody's talking about working against like, you know, props. Nothing. Nothing <laughs> to what we see we here. We still don't understand right. how it works. Give us a primer. I understand. Yeah. Except her, Rosa understands. Well, of course, everything starts with the scripts that Kate and her team writes, Kate and, and Raphael. And <clears throat> once we have those, we, we storyboard every, you know, there's 3,000 shots, and we storyboard each and every one of those. 3,000 shots. It, yeah, before we go on the stage to, to film it with, with uh, the actors. Uh -huh. And... <clears throat> But now, because of Corona, we had to prepare it even better. So we, we, we made previews of every shot. So I could communicate with the DOP, Nick Ferrero, and with the assistant director on the set. Because I wasn't there. I was uh, 9,000 miles away in Amsterdam, sitting behind my screens. You know, camera A, camera B, previous stream, storyboards. And me and Kate and my assistant and a script supervisor, we spent like... 12 hours a day or something. For me, that was from 4 p.m. till 4, 4 a.m. Now, what is it? 4 p.m. till 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Behind my screen. And, uh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> 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 I think they had more fun, more tears and more, but also more fun than, than we had. It was kind of a hard. It was thing. great to get a note because you just go, uh-huh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <yeah>. They're not <laughs> here. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, because we had to prepare it so much better than season one, it was, I don't know, I think you all felt pretty comfortable on the set, you didn't know what you were doing, you know, because we, before we start, everything is designed, so uh, we know we have digital designs of every location, we have measurements, so the people on set, like Patrick Metcalf, who was uh, on set actually leading the whole thing, you know, communicating with us, they would measure everything, put tape on the ground so they would know where, if there's supposed to be a wall, because it's all green screen, there's nothing there, there's no set at all. It's just a, a stage, mm -hmm. what you call it, green screen, green screen stage. Sorry, I just flew in from Holland, so I have to get used to the <laughs> English, sorry. Uh, and um, so for them, it's also hard to imagine everything, you know, because they know that if something's supposed to be taking place in the desert, there's nothing there, it's just green screen. So anyhow, we filmed this and we were very well pre prepared. And when we edit an, an episode, it's all being rotoscoped. And rotoscoping means tracing. It's being done actually here in Austin. I don't know yeah. if you knew that. Uh, the Minnow Mountain Studio Woo. did that. Nice. Yay, yeah, they're over here. Oh, here Let's we go. Yeah. Congratulations. So, so their team, they're tracing the, um, the actors and making sure and stylizing it, making it beautiful and making sure that all the, you know, the expressions or the micro expressions are, are still there. And then when that's done, we have a whole team of uh, oil painters. So every background that you see here is done on a huge canvas with oil paint. So there's about 1,600 oil, oil paintings. And I think you made, uh, did you count the drawings? <coughs> I think it's about 50,000 or something. I don't know. It's wow. a huge, uh, yeah, 50,000, right. <laughs> 1,600 paintings. And they're all huge. And, Beautiful. I mean, they should hang somewhere. We all got, we all got uh, oil paintings from, from various season one. scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I got a, season one. I got a close up of the. Um, it's an aerial shot, but I got a close yeah. up version of the crash from season one. Oh, that's a beautiful. And one. then a yeah. zoomed out, even more birds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of it. oh, that's it's so cool. Yeah. So amazing. But but the thing was with season one, we were talking about cars. We were building a car while driving it. We were <laughs> constantly finding things that, you know, experimenting and like, oh, there's no steering wheel and uh, let's get in the steering wheel. And so we were, we were sort of 
finding out how to do it. And then at the end of season one, it was like a well-oiled machine. Mm. And when season two started, I thought, well, it feels like I'm going to step into a Maserati and just put it on cruise control. And then Corona came, so we had to completely <laughs> no. reinvent. So then he took the bus. Yeah, then we took the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We actually did some motion capture tests with Rosa in some garage in <laughs> West Hollywood. Really? I, think. I would only do that for yeah. Undone. What was that? And Amazon Prime. Prime Daddy. <laughs> Prime Daddy was like, "Will you come to this?" <laughs> abandoned. <laughs> Will you come to this garage, parking garage, in the middle of the pandemic? I was like, we had a lot oh, of, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a lot of extras, all homeless people lying around. <laughs> yeah, it was grim. And then uh, they were like, we're gonna, you've done performance capture, also Troublemaker Studios right here, yeah. um, with Robert, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. Um, and uh, and, I, and they were, I was like, yeah, of course. I, I, the height of the technology with the head rig and the cameras, they're like, yeah, it ain't gonna be like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a, 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 a bicycle helmet with a um, with a selfie stick taped to the top of it and a phone. Basically, you know, they're running around with like this bicycle helmet. On. Like, this is just a prank. <laughs> You're not. I was like. I've stooped so low. <laughs> I sent a picture to James Cameron. He's like, whoa, making your own? <laughs> I was like, DIY. kinda. But you know, the, the alternative was what was proposed by some people was to have you film yourself with iPhones in your own home. I was like, no. Oh, I no, remember that. They pitched what, that. I was like, I don't, I don't think that's no, gonna work. It's not it gonna didn't work. work. But no. that was fun. I mean, I think that yeah. that's what the fun about Undone is that it was always um, a level of experimentation with it. And I think that's why it's like the love of all of our lives is because mm -hmm. we we go and we do other projects that are very um you know orthodox in terms of how you shoot them it's very like you know you know how it works and you kind of can get a sense of how it's going to turn out with yeah. undone it's it's never like that i mean like you said we're working in a, a green box mm -hmm. with tape it's like experimental theater it's experimental wow. theater it's like, like black when box. you're in college yeah. it's a black box and there's always a sense of like what will this it. be <laughs> there's going to be this amazing okay. gift that we all get at the end of this that it was gonna exceed our, it's gonna exceed our wildest expectations and it's so artistically gratifying. It's like every That's once in a while I would say, um, that he would direct, the, like you're gonna go here, go to the end of the blue tape and make a right at the green tape and then you're gonna look over there because there's a beautiful sunset over there and you're having a private moment and somebody comes through. I'm like, can you just show me the picture of what this is supposed to look like? Because I needed to just see something, yeah. anything, and it's just, he, they would show me the, uh, exactly, show me the um, the picture, and they also had the shadow of where I would be walking, and it was just beautiful to be able to put yourself inside the painting, and just take that journey and go, okay, now I know what the sunset looks like, and now I kind of have an idea of the person over my shoulder, it was just you were always trying to redefine it in your mind every step of the way. Wow. And that was so exciting. Just and I think so gratifying right, right, as right. an actor. Like I feel like from, we always speak about how it's the most delicious, gratifying work as an actor because of that freedom. Yeah. Because of the imaginative stuff that goes into this. Right. We're talking about the like, tape, right? The, the tape, it's, it starts off like green with like a couple pieces of tape. Right. Easy. Then by the, I mean, episode like, eight, it becomes this kaleidoscope of like different shaped tape. tapes no with like but they names don't take, on yeah, it. They don't like, take it off. And little numbers. It just keeps growing. It just numbers, keeps growing like until there's like a or like they don't, you know, inch get it. thick of just like tape snow on the ground. They're like, turn right at the pink <laughs> tape. And it's like, which one? <laughs> no, but the best is, because you it looks insane. Yeah, okay, it just tape. looks like crazy look and it's going to come out crazy <laughs> but then it's also very specific like there's yeah. a scene where I had to be at a kitchen counter pretending to wash dishes <laughs> and it was just all these boxes stacked up and then all of a sudden I'm I mean I'm ready to do it and somebody stops me and goes uh -uh, we need to make the sink lower it has to be a quarter of an inch lower and you need to stand it was just mm -hmm. Oh, Somebody yeah. kept track of these details. Well, it that's because it's, it's very expensive when, when <laughs> because we have to rebuild everything. Yeah. To have a higher counter. So yeah. We have to, yeah it's, uh, and this is, you know, there's many things that I couldn't do as a director. Like I, most shots are static, as you could see. There's uh -huh. some moving cameras, but every time I would move a camera physically on the set, yeah. 
uh, everybody was angry at me because it <laughs> cost like 20,000 euros more. <laughs> right. dollars, you know, you have to rebuild everything in 3D and then do motion capture, uh, how do you call it, the motion tracking, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. then project all those paintings on the 3D spaces mm. so that it still looks like it's painted. And that was the whole challenge of season one and of se season two is to make everything merge so they look completely like themselves or all their acting is still intact mm. but they feel like they're part of that painted world with, with what makes it so dreamy and trippy and psychedelic and psychotic you know and that's the hard thing to make everything look like it's part of the same universe mm. i would say and and clearly it works because when you're watching it as an audience whether for me having just watched so much of it or even when i'm rewatching these clips you just lose yourself in it you don't you don't you, we couldn't even think about you know the chunk of tape on the floor like we just right. everything's you it's forget. so real right it's seamless and beautiful and it's not like and something that at so all artificial becomes so real right right well, it, it would, you would think that if you have all of these, whether it's 2D animation, 3D animation, uh, you, you have rotoscope animation, you have all of these different kinds of animation, you would think that that would put a barrier between you and the, and the subject matter, you and the characters, but it, because of what we're doing, you know, uh, non-linearly and also with, with what we're doing, um, it, it only services to bring you in closer. Yeah. It's like almost elevates like if it weren't it. like yeah. this, yeah. it yeah. would be, it w would be distance. Yeah. It mm -hmm. would be like glass between us, but it, it, this show could never exist live action, obviously, until no we can bend space no. and yeah. time. But <laughs> it also would be, it wouldn't be as intimate. You know? Because all you You're have, in the art. <laughs> you don't have yeah. the trappings of the giant budgets and the, you know, everything that goes along with a giant crew, giant everything. You literally just have your character and the connections that you have and the emotional journey that you're taking. Yeah. And, and that's the words. it. And the, that's <laughs> and the it. Words that, yeah. You lose a lot when you add in all of those trappings. Mm. When you do have a big set and you do have lots of cameras and you know, you do have a lot of people, you do have all of these props and walls and like things Hostiles to interact with. And, right. <laughs> and there's a lot because what we get to do on those big things, I've worked on some slow moving beasts, my friend, and right, it is, right. you do a quarter of a page in a day. Right. We'll do like 10, 12, 15 pages a day. It doesn't stop, you know, and, and that's a luxury that you don't have on any other mm. project because you have to stop yeah. and go so much. We it's get very to fulfilling. be in it constantly. Mm -hmm. It shows in the work, congratulations. Thank um, you. I wanna show one more clip Yay. and then I wanna get Sick. some questions from the audience. You can still upload and um, upvote questions in the app, but um, let's just take a look at one more clip. Bueno, su mamá aún no ha contestado nuestras llamadas. No sé dónde puede estar. Es una persona muy privada. Creo que tiene mucho uh, Bueno, Beca, ¿y cuando viene el bebé Reed o Beca? Ay, ya veremos. Pero tenemos algo que mostrarles. ¿Les parece conocida? Encontramos esta pintura de mamá firmada por alguien llamado Alejandro. No, no conocemos a ningún Alejandro más que el hijo de Vicente Fernández. Alejandro <laughs> Fernández. ¿Quién es ese? Es un cantante muy famoso. Bueno, no, no lo conocemos. Ay, canta tan bonito las rancheras. <laughs> Hey, espera, espera, abuelita. ¿Sabes de algún novio del pasado que mamá podría estar visitando? ¿Novio? No, no tiene ningún novio del pasado. Tu mamá tiene un exnovio, yeah, pero... Cállate, Monse. No, no sabemos nada de ningún novio. ¿Puedes echarle un buen vistazo a esto solo para ver si algo se te hace conocido? Mm. No, nada. <laughs> Lo siento. Becca, you brought us in Abuelita's memory. That's mom. Something feels wrong here. Lo siento, pero no conozco esa pintura. ¿Entiendes? ¿Estás molesta, abuelita? No, pero ya no quiero hablar más a ese respecto. Ok. I don't trust abuelita. Mm -mm. I 
remember. She doesn't want to talk, but she knows something. Right? Um, <laughs> Ana Ortiz played um, so Mon Monse, Tia Monse, Tia Monse, yeah. and I remember she was like, what are we, do what is this? Like she couldn't, <laughs> she was there for like one day and she was like, I don't understand what you're doing. We're like, just jump in, you'll yeah, be yeah. fine, you'll be fine. Trust us, it'll be great. <laughs> and I think Renee Victor thought the first day that it was just a voiceover job. And so <laughs> she, she was like, what does it matter what I'm doing with my body? Leave me alone. <laughs> Well, because it's animation. Right. We're used to and just she goes, using our voices for she's that. She's like, you do the whole, you do this the whole time. <laughs> this is the whole season. She couldn't understand that. Like we did this every day for months or whatever. <laughs> like, I, I think it resonates for me personally because I, my, my mom had eight sisters, and so just like sitting around the table with like mm. you know women of all ages and backgrounds and stories, kind of around the table talking and pushing, trying to learn stories or secrets or whatever it might be, um, is just so, it feels so authentic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about this, this question for any of you uh, of, of creating this, not only this like, this, this great rich tapestry of women, but of a very, of a very you know, multicultural family, of, of just a family generally, how you sort of thought, any of you thought about sort of contributing that, that to an audience. It's, 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 it's rich, it's deep, it's deep, it's emotional too, I think. It's about time. I mean, sitting a bunch of Latino women, sitting, being just women and dealing with our own selves, dealing with our history, trying to figure things out, and the many different versions of what it means to be a Latina in the United States of America. You have like your recent immigrants, you have multi-generational, you have hybrids, you have, it, we, we're everywhere and in every kind of being. And it was so refreshing to be able to just show that to the world. And not like talk about the Latinness of the family. Yeah, we like just that's not what the, it's right, about. It's right, just we're a family, exactly. right? And I think that's so important. For me, I feel like it, it, it's it also talks about being mixed race. Mm -hmm. right. We don't ever talk about that. You're either on this under on this umbrella or you're under this umbrella. But um, I. I myself am mixed race. These the ladies same. are mixed race. And I don't know where I fit. I never have. It's and about it's feeling something I struggle with all the time. Yeah. Other. Yeah. And also we take that to another level. Kate took it to another level by being completely other when you have like magical abilities and maybe a little mentally ill. Um, and and for me, yeah, that I really like bringing that to an audience. Like, it, what does it feel like to be um, nadie aquí, nadie allá? Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Pausing on that for a moment. Yeah. That says a lot. Let's take, um, we have 10 minutes. Nine minutes is too deep. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Kate, uh, first up, uh, do you want to share or do you mind sharing some of the books that might have inspired you regarding ancient mythology, spirituality, philosophy, texts, uh, writing? Definitely, yeah. Uh, a, f a few that I keep returning to are the Dhammapada, which is a Buddhist text, and the Upanishads, which comes out of India, um, as well as the Gita, which is also from India. So some of those kind of um, older spirituality and philosophies definitely I draw from in thinking about this. And exploring them with your writing team, uh, maybe you can elaborate, we didn't really dig into this earlier, sort of the, the, the broader team or how, how your, the writing process. Yeah, so I work with a team of writers. I have a co-creator, Raphael, and then we have a team of writers that we work with. Um, and each, it's, it's wonderful because each of them brings their own kind of backgrounds and philosophies and ideas to it. So uh, it becomes like a family, which is really nice because we have debates, we have you know, arguments, but it's also like collaborating and coming together to figure out the best possible path. And of course we work in association with our executives at Amazon who do a lot of collaborating as well and helping Woo! us find the story. Um, and so figuring out sort of to use all those sounding boards to get the best message through and to figure out how to do that. And yeah, wonderful, t incredibly talented writers um, who are amazing, yeah. Uh, we have another question that's been submitted. Uh, okay, well this touches on the kind of filmmaking or the, the creative process. So as an example, in the scenes where uh, you're all 
um, in a car, for example, or you're exiting a car, you're actually filming a, are you filming that scene in a car? Uh, if you're outdoors, are you actually We've outdoors? had cars. We have had cars. On the sound stage. We um, used my car I one had time. We yeah. used my, yeah, use my car. my car. We used her car. Yeah. We've used your car. I had to like drive a car Wait into a the second, sound stage Amazon. Got it was pretty <laughs> awesome though. Y'all. Yeah. We used my car once. We used my car. <laughs> <laughs> However, but uh, we're not outdoors. Most, we most, don't go outdoors. Like we, yeah. No, in, in most cases, it was just like uh, actually just a seat. Yeah, for the car so crash. Seat, no, m m it was just more, a seat. Way more scenes when, with, when, Bob with Bob as well. With, with Bob, Bob, with that, yeah. yeah. Where there's just a steering wheel uh, attached to a seat oh, stand right. that that's would right. move all the time. Oh, that's right. And, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do have a secret scene that I can't talk about that I do know that I was inside an actual real car. It was your car. That, yeah. It was your car, and it was a Lexus. That's right. right. And I drove it to the stage in that door yeah. myself. Wow. Because it was COVID. I'm not letting other people get in my car. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then, of course, in the actual accident crash scene in season one, some of that is completely CGI, and there really are. And That's true, yeah. computer generated. Yes. That so was hilarious. Let me tell you, you think it's a glamorous job until someone's like, sit in this chair and just flail wildly <laughs> for 15 minutes. <laughs> whoa, whoa. It's like, whoa. It's amazing that you trust us. I'm an adult. Thank you. <laughs> I do trust you. I'll do anything for you. But it's, it, I think depending on what the car is doing, what's happening, where you're seeing it, it could be many different versions of, right. of a car or not a car. It, but we've never, but we've never gone outdoors. So the outdoor scenes were always inside. inside. Yeah, no, that's true. That's, that's true. Yeah. I just noticed yeah. there's names attached. So thank I you, know. Dana, for your question. Thank you, Marcus. Um, the next question is from Anonymous. Um, Ooh. Did, and then we have one more after that. Um, did the, and how did the animation style of the show, or did it have any effect on, for each of the actors, what you could do? Was it limiting, or did it allow you to do more? You started to touch on that. Maybe you can talk, yeah. elaborate on sort of. Well, I felt incredible. I feel, for myself anyway, complete freedom with, I, I, I think that the rotoscope really opens up what we can do, obviously. And I think that if you just go deep with your imagination and the relationship it comes really just about the relationships that's all you have the words the relationship i think it's so freeing as an actor to not to know that you're going to be painted and that's going to add basically another character to the to the story the rotoscoping it's interesting is 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 there's so your imagination is put to task like in season one <laughs> i'm sitting in a hospital pretend hospital room which is basically we just have a bed and a chair and um they ask me um oh, can yeah. you <laughs> act out um that dying and disintegrating <laughs> that was like, so silly what <laughs> Yeah, and then and then when you're dead and disintegrated, then you've got to come back to be like a fetus and then grow up again. <laughs> and I'm like, how the hell it's do like you, you can do, do that? that? Then, you did, then you did the same thing in, in the second season to match with that. And I was no. so intimidated. Like, how can you do that? It like, was the remember? weirdest thing I had well, been asked to do. <laughs> and it's so cool it. looking, yeah, right? So cool. I, I was just making a joke on us sometimes. No, no, no. I'm like, y'all don't, don't need me to I do mean, that. The weird thing is like when <laughs> they ask you to do these like super crazy things, you were like, Okay. Yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the sillier you go <laughs> with like, undone, right. the cooler it's yeah, going yeah, to end yeah. up looking. Be. Yeah. And it, it does. It is a lot about trust, and I think that's yeah the main effect. And that I feel the like animation season two, style we has already had that too. We had such trust with each other and with them. Like we, we know really... it's going to be cool. So yeah, right. let's go. We'll do it. Okay. Yeah, we'll yeah. do it. We'll do it. But I don't think you ever exaggerated or made it more comical or cartoony. You were no, just. No, no. You, I legitimately was trying to die in that chair <laughs> and decompose. I used to do a like street dancing called popping locking, and that kind of, as you disintegrated, it kind of went down, and then you. Pop Did back you know up, that Constance you know? is just the most legendary person of all time? <laughs> Popping and locking. Yeah, well, whatever. I got to pay my rent. <laughs> One more question. It, it's such a great question to end on. Uh, Craig, thanks for your question. <laughs> Kate, was it difficult to pitch such an unusual series? Tell us about 
Go back to way at the beginning now as we wrap up this conversation. Yeah, well, we, the pitch. we knew it was going to be a tough pitch because <laughs> even we were like, what's this show? <laughs> and so we wrote, uh, a, well, first we wrote a script, and that was actually the second script of the first season. And we presented it to our producers, like, here it is. And they're like, OK, I think we need like a little bit of runway <laughs> to what's happening here, because it was the hospital episode. Mm -hmm. So then we wrote the first episode after to kind of lead us into the characters, into the world, and get us to the point where we see Alma going through this experience. And uh, then we had those two episodes, and we, needed, we knew we needed artwork to show the style of the show. And we found Hisco. He had done work on Montage of Heck, and we saw oh, the yeah. Junkyard. And, and we thought immediately, like, this would be a perfect fit just because of the emotion. It wasn't cartoony, it wasn't gimmicky, um, it was real emotion, real depth, and he was able to really capture feeling and character. And so we approached him, and actually our producers flew up to Berkeley where you were giving a speech, Yeah. and you had just decided you were never gonna no, do... No, I wanted to stop doing animation. Yeah. I, I wanted to be a <laughs> painter for the rest of my life. Yeah, oh. because, you know, Montage of Heck nearly killed me, literally, you know, I was... Uh, I had to work too hard. Like animation is super laborious. You know, you have to work like sometimes 15 hours a day for seven days a week. Anyhow, so then I made that artwork for you. Right, right. So then he made uh, paintings for us based off the scripts. And so then we were able to go and uh, show the scripts and show the paintings. And fortunately, Amazon was interested. And they said, OK, but we still don't know what this show is. Can you do write a third script? So we did. And they said, what would a fourth script look like? <laughs> <laughs> They're sneaky. Right. So then by then we had half a season and artwork, and they said, okay, why don't you write the rest of the show? So then we got a full season order. So it, we definitely had to do a lot of proof of concept with the show. It wasn't an easy pitch. It was a lot of work, but well worth it. Well, deep and sincere congratulations to everyone on this stage. Undone is coming April 29th, but that means you have about a month and a half to dig into season one if you haven't seen it yet. So to folks here and to folks who are watching at home, thanks for participating. Hope you'll check it out. And thank you to everybody on this stage. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much thank for having you. us. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>